I just remember the first night, the night he came in to file his candidacy. It was a totally unbelievable scene. Mike Riley was a young lawyer who had just joined the Bobby Kennedy for President campaign staff. His first job was to line up people to gather petition signatures to get Kennedy on the Indiana ballot. They barely made the filing deadline. He was going to file in the State House. I'd made arrangements for them to stay open uh, that night. And uh, there were probably about eight to 10,000 people around the State House. And when he got to the State House, his suit was ripped, his cufflinks were gone. Uh, it was like he was a rock star. It was a charisma that transcended politics, but even his politics was different. Blunt, but sympathetic to people who didn't have the privileges he had. I don't think it's tolerable that young men and young women growing up in our great cities are not able to find jobs. He came from money, but money wasn't the most important thing to him. He wanted to see people treated decently and to have food and all of that education. And the same thing that Martin Luther King wanted. Dr. King headed to Memphis to intervene in a garbage worker strike just days after Kennedy arrived in Indiana. April 4th, 1968. The Kennedy campaign stops in Muncie before returning to Indianapolis that night for a planned upbeat rally in a predominantly black neighborhood at 17th and Broadway. In Memphis, an assassin shoots and kills Dr. King at the Lorraine Motel. Word of the tragedy spread slowly. Well, April the 4th, uh, I remember vividly, it was my 36th birthday. I had intended uh, to take a little time away from the mayor's office that day and <clears throat> have a family celebration. Uh, suddenly I got word that Robert Kennedy was not only in the state, but he was determined to come to 17th and Broadway for a night meeting. Uh, 17th and Broadway in, in those days was a very difficult neighborhood in terms of crime, in terms of all sorts of difficulties. Uh, so immediately I tried, I came back to the mayor's office, I tried to get in touch with the Kennedy campaign and said, please don't do it. Uh, but they were quite insistent. They wanted to make the point. They had thought about 17th and Broadway. All the controversies, the turmoil, were very deliberate in wanting to come there. So I went to the Murat Hotel. As it turned out, coincidentally, this was where the Kennedys were going to spend the night. And a lot of their campaign organization was located even then. But I was in the basement at a small banquet for the Shortridge High School basketball team. I was a Shoreage High School man. This is the first time Shoreage had ever got to the final game of the tournament. And so I got word while I was sitting in the basement of the Murat Hotel with the Shoreage team uh, that uh, Dr. King had been shot. At that time, the police officer who came to tell me did not know whether he had died. But I thought, oh my. When uh, the death of Martin Luther King was announced, Bobby was traveling with a lawyer that was his constant companion by the name of Fred Dutton. So Fred Dutton called me and he said, look, Bobby still wants to speak, so don't call that off. And it was on the way to the rally that I learned that Dr. King had died. So I learned it over the radio, so it didn't come as a surprise to me, but of course I was still in shock. But most people attending the rally did not know the bad news. Bill Crawford returned to 17th and Broadway to set the scene. It was in that general vicinity where the flatbed was. And where were you? Where were you watching from? From out in this area here with the crowd standing in front of the flatbed. And uh, it was a miserable night that night. Dreary and wet and cold. It's not like today where there's instant communication. Uh, the crowd had no idea that, or many in the crowd, because when he started and said that, there was like this collective gas. gas. I have some very sad news for all of you. Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis. <laughs> And then I, somehow, I guess, it became real that uh, Dr. Martin Luther King had indeed been killed. Shock, surprise, and in anger. 
And then, uh, like everybody else, I uh, listened to the speech. It was a touching uh, moment in, in that you could tell it wasn't written by any speechwriter, and he spoke from his heart. For those of you who are black and are tempted to fill with, be filled with hatred and mistrust of the injustice of such an act against all white people, I would only say that I can also feel in my own heart the same kind of feeling. I had a member of my family killed, but he was killed by a white man. But we have to make an effort in the United States. We have to make an effort to understand, to get beyond or go beyond these rather difficult times. My favorite poem, I, my favorite poet was Aeschylus. And he once wrote, Even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own day despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. And the thing that really struck me the most was that oftentimes we think that people speak above us and that they have to lower their uh, English language and everything speak to minorities. He didn't do that. And of course we rose to the occasion. Well, we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand and to comprehend and replace that violence, that stain of bloodshed that is spread across our land with an effort to understand compassion and love to tame the savageness of man and make gentle the life of this world. Let us dedicate ourselves to that and say a prayer for our country and for our people. Thank you very much. If there was going to be an angry reaction, if there was going to be a, someone who would strike the match, it would have been those of us that were the young, quote unquote, radical activist. And uh, the tenor of his remarks, the sincerity of his remarks, uh, dampen our anger. Fred Dutton said that's the first time that he had ever heard him say anything about his brother uh, in public, about commenting on the fact that he had been assassinated. Obviously, there was no way that you could predict how things were going to come out. Robert Kennedy's speech, which is been shown for many, many years, a magnificent speech, not only under the circumstances, but under any circumstances. There were awful riots the night that Dr. King died. In Indianapolis, there wasn't the rioting, the looting. People were really torn up about it. It was a horrible thing, and yet they lived it the way Dr. King would have liked for it to be lived. The stars were aligned and uh, we believe that God's hand was in it that night. But did anyone realize back in 1968 just how significant that speech was? No, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I've been to Arlington. I've seen that those words. I remember uh, thinking that's truly appropriate for those to be there. But uh, I think more of the focus nationwide was on the rioting and his speech was sort of a footnote and and was not really uh, appreciated until later but his love and wisdom and compassion toward one another 